Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to the Watchman Newscast live stream. We've got some breaking news as I come to you around 4 p.m. Eastern time here in the United States where I'm sitting. A hostage deal between Israel and Hamas is in the works. And by the time you watch this, folks, it may already be finalized. Now, as I come to air here again, it's around 4.05 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. The Israeli cabinet uh, of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting. They've been meeting throughout the evening, and they're trying to hammer down the final details of this deal, this agreement with Hamas that would see dozens of Israeli hostages released. Now, here are the details that we have so far. I'm just going to read right here off my phone from the Times of Israel. They've got the breaking details. They're based in Israel, so they're very up to the minute. Here's what we have, folks, and I preface this by saying I want to get your thoughts. We've got a very active chat here on the live stream, so let me know what you think. Already some people are saying, deal with Hamas, no way. So I want to know your thoughts. There are various schools of thought on it, and many in Israel Israel already have opposed it. Some support it, but I want to know what you think, our Watchmen viewers. So leave your thoughts in the chat as I read out these details for you of this potential deal. Well, not potential. It's about to be finalized. Various reports of the deal have indicated that somewhere between 50 and 100 Israeli and foreign hostages would be released. And remember, there's some 240 still being held by Hamas. So between 50 and 100 Israeli and foreign hostages would be released in exchange for a five-day break in fighting and the release of somewhere between 150 and 300 Palestinian prisoners being held in Israeli jails. So right there, folks, you have basic parameters, 50 to 100 Israelis and other, remember, there were other foreign citizens taken as well on October 7th by Hamas, including some U.S. citizens and people from other countries as well. Obviously, vast majority were Israeli citizens, but 50 to 100 released in exchange for 150 to 300 Palestinian prisoners. And the main rub here is that five-day break in fighting. And that's the main issue that many in Israel have a serious problem with. Do you give Hamas a second wind, a chance to regroup? The IDF, as we've been reporting here in the newscast over the past several days, has had major momentum in this offensive to crush Hamas once and for all. Does Hamas get a chance to regroup? We'll discuss it more in a minute. Here's more details on the deal. And again, I want to get your thoughts. Make sure to leave them here. Uh, An Israeli government source told Israeli reporters today that the deal is expected to see the release of 50 living Israeli citizens. I, I hope they're living, but sometimes Israel... They Not sometimes, all the time. Israel also wants to get the remains of anyone, sadly, who was killed by these terrorists as well. But the release of 50 citizens, Israelis, mostly women and children, in groups of 12 to 13 people per day. In exchange, Israel will release Palestinian women and minors from Israeli prisons and return them to where they used to live mostly the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland, and East Jerusalem. Israel would also pause fighting for at least four days and allow the entry of more fuel to the Gaza Strip. So Israel is not, uh, it's a deal. There's give and take for sure. Israel is not just getting these hostages back. Israel's giving something to Hamas in return, and many have serious mixed feelings about that. The source said that all Israeli security agencies, the IDF, the Shin Bet, and the Mossad are in favor of this emerging deal. The official said that Netanyahu has insisted on certain elements being part of the deal, including the potential for the ongoing release of hostages, even after that four to five day pause that I just mentioned. He also wants a commitment by Hamas to identify and locate hostages being held by other terror groups like Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip. And the refusal, he refuses to release any Palestinian prisoners who have been convicted of murder. I would hope not. Israel believes Hamas could potentially locate some 30 more 
Israeli mothers and children beyond the initial 50 who would be released, and that the halt in fighting could be extended by an extra day for each group of Israeli hostages that is located and freed. Wow. So Netanyahu also said today, folks, that uh, Israel would finish the job in Gaza. Remember, the stated goal of Israel's political and military leaders has been to crush Hamas once and for all, eliminate Hamas, so that it essentially does not exist, at least in any form in which it can ever threaten the state of Israel ever again. That's the stated goal of Israeli leaders in both the military and political spheres, and they were well on their way to accomplishing that. They, they've been. Hamas is on the ropes. Israel controls northern Gaza right now. Hamas has essentially lost control of the Strip. Most of its forces have now fled south, including reportedly some of its top leadership also in the south, most likely in Khan Yunus and in that area. So Israel is tightening the squeeze on Hamas and making major strides towards that goal, again, of eliminating Hamas. So I ask you, everyone watching, bearing in mind, number one, that everyone wants to see the hostages come home here on The Watchmen. Hey, if you've been watching us over the past few weeks, you know, I have been interviewing family members of the hostages. Folks, it is heart wrenching. These are the most difficult interviews I have ever conducted in my career. Bar none. Also, I believe the most important because we're keeping this story, and it's more than a story, it's people's lives. The hostages were keeping their stories, though, alive so that the world doesn't forget. And, and you and I know, if you're watching this, we've talked about this a bunch. The world has largely already forgotten about October 7th. Not only that, large chunks of the world seem to have swung to the other side and have accepted the Hamas narrative of October 7th and are actively supporting Hamas and castigating Israel. Nonetheless, the hostages remain 238, it seems now, because over the past few days, two hostages were found dead in Gaza. So I believe that number would be decreased now from 240 to 238. Are all 238 alive? Obviously, a, a major question there. I say all that to say, folks, that if hostages are released, if women and children come home to their families and they're taken out of the hell of the bowels of these tunnels beneath Gaza, everyone's happy about that. But on the flip side, a four to five day pause in fighting, nearly a week pause, essentially a short term ceasefire when Israel had gained so much momentum and again was squeezing Hamas. Hamas right now has its backs against the wall. Not only that, you're releasing Palestinian prisoners and those prisoner swaps in the past for Israel uh, have not always gone so well. I think back to 2011, Gilad Shalit, uh, an Israeli soldier, was released from Hamas captivity after, I believe, three or four years. I believe it was four years, even longer, perhaps five, uh, in captivity in exchange for over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners, including Yahya Sinwar, who was now the leader of Hamas in Gaza, who was a notorious butcher. So Israel paid a heavy price, obviously, to get Gilad Shalit back. Is the price in this case, uh, is does it, as some, look, the cabinet is overwhelmingly, Netanyahu's cabinet will overwhelmingly support the decision to bring the hostages home. Uh, some uh, in the cabinet, I'm thinking of, Bezalal Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gvir, uh, who are right-wing members of the coalition. They're, they're against it. They're saying it endangers, this deal would endanger Israel's security, give Hamas new life, and break that momentum that I was mentioning. Folks, it's a tough one. I mean, no doubt. Uh, again, you want to save women and children and the elderly from the hell of Hamas tunnels beneath Gaza. Obviously, that goes without saying. And here in the Watchmen, we've been banging that drum louder than anyone over the past few weeks. Uh, at the same time, look, five-day potentially pause in fighting. How does Hamas use those five days? Uh, does Israel lose any momentum? Uh, does Israel, and Netanyahu, again, I mentioned a minute ago, Netanyahu is vowing to restart the stated goal and the stated initiative to destroy Hamas once these hostages uh, are exchanged. But is Hamas emboldened by this in that, wow, Hamas says, okay, 
We released, say, 50 hostages, and Israel paid a pretty high price. Look, they paused fighting for five days. They gave up hundreds of Palestinian prisoners, perhaps Hamas, and, and with, I'm sure, active direction from the Iranian regime. Perhaps Hamas says, wow, let's offer another 30 hostages to Israel. But this time, our asking price will be even higher. This time, we'll ask for a 1,000 Palestinian prisoners, and not just uh, women and, and younger people under the age of 18 or under the age of 21. We're, we're going to ask for the worst of the worst, including, yes, Hamas members and Palestinians in Israeli prisoners in Israeli prisons who've committed murder. Does the asking price rise with each successive hostage swap? Folks, this is not easy, no doubt. There's a lot to think about here, and I know Israel's cabinet, led by the prime minister, is discussing it, thinking about it, going back and forth. They've been doing so all evening, as I mentioned. So, wow, let me see your thoughts here. And everyone's kind of, this chat is very active. we got thousands of people with us right now. We will have thousands more before, we're, before we are done. Hey, as you were chatting and leaving your thoughts on all this, and we have a very educated audience of watchmen and women on the wall, Hey, if this is your first time watching, if you are just checking us out and you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted. We're posting practically seven days a week during this war most times, and we don't want you to miss any of our live streams. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss a video. And if you do, for some reason, check out our archives here just under newscasts. On the homepage, we had a very strong show yesterday, by the way, with our good friend, Pastor Jack Hibbs, where he talked about the prophetic implications of everything unfolding right now in Gaza, Lebanon, and beyond. I strongly encourage you to check that out. That was yesterday, November 20th. So obviously the hostage story and this exchange that's at the doorstep, it seems, it's now close to 4.20 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, November 21st. What's it going to be? Is this going to be, is this going to break the momentum? It's going to be, hey, the, the images are, are going to be incredible of families reunited. And we, we fully are thrilled about that, supportive of that, no doubt. But the, the question some in Israel are asking again is, does this break the momentum of Israel's operation in Gaza, which is a very necessary operation with a very necessary end game of destroying Hamas? Now, I've noticed that some in Israel are saying, okay, in the next five days, if there is indeed that four to five day pause and, and the hostage that comes along with this proposed deal, some are saying, okay, does the IDF lie dormant for the next four or five days? Some have said, perhaps this is a chance for the Israel Defense Forces to shift their focus to other fronts. And two fronts in particular that I'm talking about, folks, vis-a-vis -vis Israel, that would be the northern front with Hezbollah and the front to the deep south in Yemen in the form of the Houthis. I want to break that down. Before I do, I want to hit on another front in Iran's ring of fire. Remember that ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. That's one ring that may be quiet for the next few days. Hezbollah, of course, in Lebanon. We have the Houthis in Yemen, and we have those Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. Let's focus right now for a minute. Look, I want to move on to Hezbollah and Hamas and what's coming there. I think the, the Hezbollah question, look, we know, folks, that that showdown's coming, that great northern war that we've talked about so much here in the newscast. The Houthis are a new, not a new wrinkle, but an emerging wrinkle here where the Houthis are vowing, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, they're vowing to continue attacking Israel. Uh, this is a big deal, and Israel may be forced to respond. I want to talk about that with you all, but before I do, the United States, also a presence in the Middle East. I talked about those other rings in Iraq and Syria. Here's the latest there. Uh, just today, ballistic missile launch, as I just pull this up, I want to quote directly Ballistic missiles launched by, now ABC News calls them Iran-backed militants. We call them terrorists here in the Watchmen. But nonetheless, the U.S. military, I'm just quoting directly from my phone. That's why I'm looking down. Pardon me. 
the U.S. military fired back at Iran-backed terrorists, my words, who injured several troops in Iraq early Tuesday morning local time, according to U.S. officials. The militants launched a ballistic missile attack from a truck against U.S. forces at Al-Assad Air Base in western Iraq, leaving several U.S. service members with minor injuries, according to U.S. officials. Now listen, this is close to 60 attacks, and we've been documenting this here on the newscast, close to 60 attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria carried out by Iran-backed militias, terrorist militias, since October 7th. And you can compress that time frame even more. It's really in the past three or four weeks, we've seen a massive, massive uptick in what have become literally daily attacks. Drones, rockets, missiles launched at U.S. bases, housing U.S. soldiers, U.S. citizens, U.S. contractors in Iraq and Syria. Quick reminder, some 900 U.S. soldiers still in Syria and about 2,500, I believe, in Iraq, between 2,000 and 3,000 in Iraq still. The Iranian regime's goal is to push them out of the region once and for all, obviously to send them running, uh, which the Biden administration certainly gave that impression in Afghanistan. Remember that, August 2021, the Iranian regime wants to duplicate that in Iraq and Syria, see the U.S. emptied out of the region. Now, that's not the fault of U.S. soldiers, the brave U.S. soldiers, but what happened in Afghanistan was the fault of the U.S. political so-called leadership. And Iran is banking on that once again. The Iranian regime, folks, wants to wear the United States down in the region because they believe that the U.S. won't respond in any meaningful way. Yes, the Biden administration has sent two carrier groups to the Mediterranean, no doubt, as a deterrent to Iran and Hezbollah. But at the end of the day, and yes, the administration has conducted some sporadic keyword there airstrikes in eastern syria along the iraq border against various weapons factories and iranian militias and iran gets that but i mentioned the word sporadic and again that's the key word here folks does the iranian regime despite the u.s presence despite the carrier groups that i mentioned and this is a question we've been posing for months really when we talk about the u.s and the U.S. presence in the Middle East, does the Iranian regime believe that there is teeth and a real intent to actually use force behind these U.S. shows of force? Is that all they are? Are these just shows of force? When the U.S. under Biden sends carrier groups and has uh, is up the troop presence a bit in the Middle East, in the region, is it just for show? Or does Iran believe, wow, wait a minute, we better not cross that line because the U.S. may actually use these assets? Or does Iran say, you know what, they might carry out some airstrikes along the Syria, some limited, limited airstrikes, which the Biden administration has taken great pains to say, look, these are defensive airstrikes. They're just a response. Does Iran see that and take the calculus of the situation and say, Let's keep striking. There's no teeth behind their response, really. They're not serious about really sending a message. This isn't January 2020 when the U.S. Uh, under President Trump, who was then commander in chief, eliminated Qasem Soleimani, who was the terror master of Iran and arguably the second most powerful man in the entire Iranian regime. Now, that was a message sent. I'm not sure sporadic limited airstrikes against some weapons factories and weapons depots along the Iraq-Syria border sends the kind of deterrent message that the current administration insists it is trying to send. So you're going to have, that means, continued airstrikes. And we've had dozens now, folks, of U.S. soldiers injured in these strikes by Iran. These are acts of war by the Iranian regime, no doubt. And there has not been a meaningful, serious response that would make Iran think twice, quite clearly. It just hasn't come. Uh, airstrikes were carried out. The U.S. assesses, I'm just reading again, quoting, just reading this straight off my phone for you. I don't want to misquote it. The U.S. assesses several of the Iran-linked fighters were killed in a swift counter-strike 
uh, by the United States. But it just doesn't seem to be enough to really get the regime's attention because Iran continues to direct more attacks against the United States. So, folks, keep an eye on that. The problem here, I believe, is that the White House has pretty much played its hand and told Iran, look, we don't want to escalate anything but that. If you behave yourself, we we will too. We don't want to escalate. They've actually verbalized that and said, look, these are just defensive airstrikes. We don't want to do it, but we have to do something when you're injuring our troops. we got to respond in some way to save face a little bit. That's the messaging basically coming out of the White House. Iran reads between the lines and they can see that. The messaging should be keeping the regime guessing and saying, look, if you do that again, you will face the full might of the U.S. military, and you will regret it. And having actual teeth behind that and sending a message, a real message, I don't think Iran's gotten the memo so far, folks. So stay tuned. This is, it, it, to my mind, an underreported story in the Middle East right now, the U.S. role and Iran's challenging of the United States in the region. But back to Israel, and okay, Pause in fighting, perhaps, over the next four or five days, as we've been discussing. What about the other fronts? Now, Israel and Hamas. Okay, say there's a mini ceasefire for four to five days. Number one, does Israel go back in and resume, as Netanyahu has promised? Uh, They better, because the Israeli public demands it. They demand justice after the massacre of October 7th, the slaughter of men, women, children, the elderly, the greatest massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust— The people of Israel demand justice as well they should. And they demand that Hamas, the free world demands Hamas should be crushed. So I would expect that for the current government to keep its promise to crush Hamas and resume the operation. Unless, as we mentioned, Hamas dangles more hostages and tries to string this thing out and makes bigger and bigger asks of Israel in return, we shall see. But in the meantime, does that mean that the continued, and there are more than skirmishes now, between Israel and Hezbollah to the north also cease over the next few days. Does that mean that the Houthis in Yemen also cease and desist from firing rockets, drones, missiles, from seizing shipping in the Red Sea over the next four to five days? Uh, I would think not. And I'd go further to say that Yesterday, and this was just breaking on yesterday's newscast, we didn't dig into it like I wanted to. But look, yesterday, to me, it's been escalation after escalation on the part of Hezbollah over the past few weeks. But yesterday, a an Israeli military base in the north was struck by a Hezbollah missile. Folks, there's escalations, and then there are escalations. I think we have gotten to the point where I don't know how long Israel can hold off and not make a major statement in the North. Now, I'm talking about the U.S. making a statement to the Iranian regime, right? Because in the region, the likes of the Iranian regime, Hezbollah, Hamas, folks, they only respect the strong horse, and they will fear the strong horse. They won't act if they feel that the full wrath of the U.S. or the Israeli militaries will come down upon their heads. I don't believe that Hamas expected this kind of response for, for, from Israel in the wake of October 7th. As horrific, as historically evil, demonic, and deadly as October 7th was, it seems that Hamas didn't think Israel, they thought Israel would respond in a major way, but not go all in. And Israel's been all in and making major, major gains. Um, with Hezbollah, They are also poking the bear, so to speak. And to me, yesterday crossed the threshold to attack a U.S. military base, or I'm sorry, an Israeli military base uh, in northern Israel. Is there a chance that over the next few days, Israel shifts to the north? And if not engaging in a full-fledged war with Hezbollah, these skirmishes, which are already more than skirmishes, start to get broader and bigger. There's a chance of that over the next few days, no doubt. Hezbollah has crossed so many lines, folks, over the past few weeks that they would have never been permitted to cross if Israel wasn't 
a little bit tied up, obviously, in Gaza dealing with Hamas. Israel's goal here has been to afford to avoid, for now, multiple fronts, to avoid seeing that entire Iranian ring of fire ignite. They're trying to focus on Gaza, finish a job there, and then shift their attention in a major way to Hezbollah in the north. Because, folks, the situation in the north is unsustainable, as it is currently construed, in that, look, some 32 Israeli communities in northern Israel have evacuated. They're gone. And guess what? As long as Hezbollah continues to be perched on Israel's northern border, right along that Israel-Lebanon border, then those Israelis who live right along that border are not going to return. And can you blame them? They're concerned that if they return and Hezbollah is still fully intact and across the border, that Hezbollah will look to duplicate October 7th, storm across the northern border, and repeat what Hamas did, but by many, many magnitudes worse, because remember, Hezbollah is a much more lethal and advanced fighting force than is Hamas. So Israeli leaders have to know that the situation in the north is unsustainable and that it must be dealt with sooner rather than later. Look, deterrence did not work when it came to Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Clearly, Israel, prior to October 7th, Israel's political and military establishments seemed to believe that Hamas was firmly deterred, by and large, in Gaza. That theory was blown out the window on October 7th. And I don't think Israel believes, I know Israel doesn't believe, that it can make the same mistake this time around. Israel can't lull itself into a false sense of security and say, you know what? Hezbollah is deterred. I don't think Israel is going to make that mistake twice. I think it's much more likely that Israel goes on the offensive and says, you know what? We allowed the Hamas threat to fester, to gather. It bit us horrifically on October 7th. We've allowed it in southern Lebanon as well, where Hezbollah has now some 150,000, probably more, rockets and missiles pointed at every inch of the world's one and only Jewish state. The big question we've been asking now for some seven weeks is when does the true battle to the north begin? We've had battles so far between Israel and Hezbollah, probably at this point, and Hezbollah has not been very forthcoming in recent days with the casualty totals, but some 90 Hezbollah fighters, terrorists reportedly killed in these exchanges with Israel. So Hezbollah is paying a price, but they're also every single day firing on Israeli communities to the north. It's unsustainable. Israel is going to have to deal with it. Stay tuned. Next, as we talk about what happens over the next four to five days. And look, someone just commented, I'm looking at our chat, 50 hostages released is too little. And hey, look, like I said, opponents of this deal, folks in Israel, are saying we should have kept pushing and kept pushing and kept squeezing Hamas and crushing them until they pleaded with us and agreed to release every last hostage, not just 50 in increments. Again, this is going to be a big topic of, con topic of conversation throughout the rest of today and through the next few days. And everyone's leaving their thoughts. I can't wait to read the chat. I'm glancing at it now, but when we're done, I'll read the comments and, and leave a comment here, by the way, on the channel underneath this video and keep the chat going, the live chat. I can't wait to hear what you all are saying because we have a very educated audience here at The Watchman. I respect you greatly and your take on things. So I love coming to you every day. It's 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 fun uh, to do it with such an educated, well-informed audience uh, and also an audience, many of whom uh, have the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is news from a Christian perspective and we proudly and unapologetically proclaim that and we will continue to do so. But the Houthis in Yemen, Okay, I want to pull up some direct quotes for you from the Houthis. Funny name, I know, but it's a name you need to know in that the Houthis, they lie some 1,000 miles south of Israel, uh, off the Red Sea coast in Yemen, just south of Saudi Arabia. But folks, I mentioned earlier, they're a, a, 
an increasingly crucial ring of Iran's ring of fire, and they've been increasingly active with, again, rockets, missiles, attack drones launched at Israel. They hijacked a cargo ship in the Red Sea over the weekend. They claimed it was partially Israeli-owned. Israel says no. There was no Israeli or Jewish link to this cargo ship, the Galaxy Leader merchant ship that was seized in the Red Sea on Sunday. Now, the Houthis are saying that as long as the war in Gaza continues, quote, I'm reading a direct quote from one of their leaders, we will not stand idly by in the face of the Zionist aggression against the Palestinian people and the international and American outcry in support of the Zionist entity. We have many options to attack Israel, he said, if the war in Gaza doesn't end, and we will expand our operations if the war continues. He, and he also went on to claim, hey, Iran had nothing to do with our decision to hijack what we thought was an Israeli-owned ship in the Red Sea on Sunday. I'm sure. I'm sure Iran is, was just shocked by it all. Just like Iran was shocked by October 7th and shocked by these repeated attacks against U.S. soldiers in Iraq and Syria. This has been the Iranian regime's game, folks, since it came to power in 1979, uh, setting up in their view, plausible deniability, having their proxies murder Israelis, Americans, Saudis, and others, acting through proxy, Houthis, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, militias, etc. The list goes on, and then saying, we didn't do it. We had nothing to do with it. Even though Iran hosted some 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad operatives on Iranian soil in September 2023, in the run-up to October 7th, we didn't know anything about it, they say. And the list goes on and on. Plausible deniability. Where, look, Iran's not getting its hands dirty directly. No, no, no. It's always said in the region that the Iranian regime is willing to fight to the last drop of Arab blood. Remember, the Iranian regime, they're Persians. They are not Arabs, folks. These are Persians who are at the helm of the Iranian regime. But their proxies are overwhelmingly Arab in the form of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, the militias in Iraq and Syria. Interesting how that works. And for all the Hamas, pro-Hamas forces and cheerleaders, how does it feel to be a puppet and cannon fodder for the Iranian regime? That's essentially what you are. If you're Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, you are cannon fodder for the mullahs in Tehran. How does that make you feel? But will Israel eventually, folks, as we close here, react on what's a third front? Look, I've argued the second front is already open in southern Lebanon. It's open. Not all the way, but it's open. There's daily battles. Can Israel stand idly by? Now ships are being hijacked in the Red Sea. Can Israel sit idly by and allow the Houthis to continue what they've been doing? Or is Israel eventually going to be forced to act? Now, the Israeli Air Force's chief said last Thursday that, look, we have plans to act throughout the region, including in Yemen against the Houthis. Is Israel going to send a message to the Houthis? The Houthis are not as advanced a fighting force uh, as Hezbollah, of course, or Hamas. But the Houthis have made a lot of problems in Yemen over the past nine years or so, and for Saudi Arabia, and for the UAE. And the Houthis are armed, supported, trained, and supplied by, you guessed it, the Iranian regime. So they're also nothing to sneeze at. But they are also 1,000 miles away from Israel, to the south. They can launch rockets and attack drones and missiles, yes. And, and that's bad enough. But you're not going to see the Houthis mount a ground invasion or storm across the border like Hamas did and like Hezbollah could do being perched, obviously, right on Israel's immediate borders. Nonetheless, can Israel really countenance and accept a hostile entity firing projectiles at it on is it increasingly a regular basis in the form of the Houthis? I don't think so. And historically, Israel would never accept something like that. The only hesitation would be, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago about Hezbollah, Hezbollah would have never, ever done what they've been doing over the past month plus without a massive, overwhelming, crushing response by Israel. The only reason you haven't seen it in Lebanon and the only reason you haven't seen it in Yemen so far is 
the Gaza factor. Obviously, Israel's main focus is getting the hostages back and crushing Hamas right now. But folks, everything's on the table, and I will be watching, and I know you'll be watching along with me over the next four or five days, if indeed we're about to see that temporary ceasefire, to see what happens on those other fronts. And by the way, to see what happens in Gaza, to see if Hamas holds its fire and sticks to the deal, and to see if Hamas is emboldened by this, and if they make, again, larger asks and larger uh, requests for more Hamas terrorists and Israeli prisons, a lot going on during this Thanksgiving week here in the United States. We'll be back with you tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more to discuss. Folks, pray for wisdom and discernment and clarity for Israel's leaders right now, that they make the right decisions here, that they call on God Almighty, the God of Israel, to guide their steps and guide their decisions. That's the key thing, that they call on God, the the Lord your God, to guide their decisions here. That is the main uh, aspect uh, of prayer right now, I think, that they look to the Lord for guidance right now in what to do here and how to move forward. It is not an easy situation, clearly. And we also pray for the hostages that they do, no matter what happens, that they all, every last one, returns home safely to their families. I've prayed here and I've led prayers here in the newscast for a miraculous hostage rescue. Genesis 14, 1 Samuel, I gave some biblical precedence for it. And we shall see. And no matter how it happens, we pray that all of those hostages come home. But we don't want it to happen at the expense of Israel's security. A lot of difficult decisions to be made in Jerusalem. We'll keep you posted on all of them. Until tomorrow, thanks for joining us. God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.